Thank you very much for coming, everybody. Hello, um, Brighton. And, yeah, hello, Brighton. Um, yeah, welcome to this uh, Fender in conversation with... Uh, I'm Stephen Mack from, uh, well, currently BBC uh, Radio 6 Music. Uh, our esteemed guest uh, is uh, the man, well, who's taunted and toyed uh, with guitars for virtually four decades. Uh, now, a man who's helped to detune and retune the sound of alternative rock music on both sides of the Atlantic uh, for years and years. A trailblazer, ladies and gentlemen, proper round of applause this time for Thurston Moore, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. I, I mean, the thing is, and you've answered this a thousand times, but some people might not know, so we should do some basics, like when you actually first picked up a guitar and how old were you? And what, what made you want to pick up a guitar in the first I actually, place? I actually... I sort of fancied uh, myself being a drummer when I was a little kid. Um, I thought drummers were really cool. Um, but later on, I would realize that drummers really have the thankless task of having the most gear. Yes. So in a way, the lead singer was, uh, eventually became the coolest person because they only had a microphone. And they didn't even have to carry that around, actually. Yeah. So um, I, I regretted doing anything except for becoming a lead singer. <laughs> so it's too late now, I suppose. But um, the guitar, I had, you know, I have an older brother. He's five years older. And he sort of brought rock and roll into our house in the early 60s. I was born in 1958. So he brought Louie Louie in, the Kingsman single in 63. Right. And that was kind of the first time rock and roll was sort of heard in our house. We had a very musical house. My father was a classical pianist and his oh, mother- I was going to say, what did your folks make of? Yeah. Because obviously there are loads of stories from around that time of parents being shocked and appalled by their by their teenagers getting into Well, they weren't the quite rock. clear of what rock and roll was, whether it was valid or not. I mean, I think my father and his ilk were just sort of like, it was this teenage music that didn't really have that much value uh, beyond just being for kicks. Maybe they were right at the time, you know, around that time. But uh, no, it, 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 it kind of brought this whole new energy into our household. And I knew right away that that's something that I wanted to do. And I would see sort of like um, garish rock bands playing at, like, at my school that would play. And so I would play, my first guitar was a, was a tennis racket. And that was, <laughs> we've all been there. Which I think was most people who fancied themselves guitar players when they were younger, you would pick up something that, would, that was at least shaped like a guitar, but you couldn't really afford one. I, to, to me, to, to acquire a guitar seemed kind of uh, just completely fantastical. But I, had a, I did have a tennis racket, so I would play the strings on a tennis racket mm. and imagine I was playing guitar. And I think that was kind of... Uh, I, well, I still kind of do that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> when, when did you finally first buy a guitar, then? How old were you? And do you I, know what, what was it, your first I, guitar? I, well, there's a couple of guitars that came into our household, and um, I didn't really know how to sort of approach it so much. It just seemed a little, uh, it, it seemed a little scary to me. But again, my older brother started actually seriously playing electric guitar, and by the time... Uh, I got into my early teens, uh, he had sort of gifted me a Fender uh, Stratocaster. Really? Um, which right. was that he, he was playing with his friends and they just sort of found this guitar. When I say found in quotation marks, <laughs> uh, they, it was a bit of a thing that fell off a truck, as they say. Right. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, at least that's what I was led to believe. And so all of a sudden I had this, this white Fender Stratocaster, and I think it was a bit of a early 70s, late 60s, like uh, a Fender Stratocaster. And that's when I seriously started playing guitar. But, you know, I was, the kind of music I was interested in wasn't really, um, it wasn't about being a guitar player. I just wanted to make sound, you know. So the idea of, of just like making sound and noise was, was primary for me. And the guitar was just a tool for that. When you, know. you say you play seriously, I mean, did you, so did your brother teach you, or did you teach yourself? I or gleaned. Did you it was gleaning. Gleaning. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think I took one lesson one afternoon at a community guitar place at a school, and I walked in, and I had a sticker on my guitar that said STP, which was like sort of a racing car motor oil company, which was kind of a cool sticker to put on your guitar, but it wasn't cool in that guitar class. And they were all sitting around playing Kumbaya on guitar, and they're <laughs> learning those chords. And I was just like, I'm not, uh, this is not what I want to do. I want to play Louie Louie. And uh, so... <laughs> I didn't go back, and it, but it, you know it wasn't until like I it, by the time I was 16, it wasn't until I sort of saw the Ramones or and heard about the Ramones, 
that I realized like that's kind of what I want to do. I want to play guitar with that kind of band. Like that was the band that I thought was. I loved all the bands before that. I loved Zeppelin and Floyd and you know the big times, but but I never really could see myself reaching that height of guitar mastery. It seemed like a lot of work. It seemed like going to sort of a school to be a dentist or something. Like you really had to sort of apply yourself for years before you could even step on stage. I wanted to get on stage immediately, and all of a sudden I saw a band that just was playing such rudimentary uh, bar chording and with really simple moves, playing this fantastic music that just sort of had, a, 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 you know, had an immediacy and a presence, and there were incredible songs. And I was really interested in the song. So that to me was like, they, they've accomplished that. And this lead singer was a tall, as tall as I was, like, you know, usually lead singers were like Robert Plant. They were like, their shirts were open with their hairy chest and they were swinging the microphone or Roger Daltrey or something. And I wasn't that. I was like a, I was a, a, a tall, gawky, like, um, all wrong looking kind of person. But Joey Ramone was that. Was that going? And so I was like, that's, all of a sudden I had a model, and that was what I kind of went for. Yeah, you, I've got one of your guitars with you, one of your uh, many guitars. We will get to that in a second. Do you want to give us a bit of your early punk rock? Uh, when we did this for Six Music, you played us one of the first songs you ever wrote. Do you remember that? Uh, just get, if you give us, if you give us give one, one now. for us, yeah, go on. Well, I, you know, go. the thing is with this guitar is it's it's tuned to a new tuning that I just sort of came up with. Oh wow, okay, all right. I mean, well, I we'll come back. We'll come back to that then. I, I don't know just, what I would play on it except for some just like unbridled feedback and noise, <laughs> which is. <laughs> well, I think I, I think that's what everyone's here to see. So we're, yeah, yeah. We're, when um, so when did you actually? So when did, do you remember the first experience of? I don't know where you bought your first guitar from, whether it was bought from a friend, or do, do you remember going into a record shop for the first time, because, um, uh, record shop, uh, into a, 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 guitar store. a guitar shop for the first time, because I've been in musical instrument shops, and they were to me like record shops when I first started going into yeah. the, the indie record shops, you know, the, around the era of punk rock, and they were, they were quite intimidating places. Guitar, you, yeah, guitar stores were for professional guitar players. Yeah. And so, Moving to New York City in 1977, 76, 77, and I finally sort of got my own apartment sometime in 78, but I was sort of crashing around. Um, and the guitar I had was the one my brother gave to me, the Stratocaster, which got stolen out of my first New York apartment. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was deep in the Lower East Side of New York. Things get stolen all the time out of the, at, that, at that time around yeah. these kind of places. Yeah. So um, I think that I, I went to a, not so much a guitar store, but like a pawn shop, you know, like a, a bit of a charity shop, and just bought like a very cheap guitar. And it didn't sound very good tuned uh, traditionally, but I, I, I kind of was playing with a band in uh, New York that was students coming out of Rhode Island School of Design. It was a school that David Byrne and, and, and Tina Weymouth and Talking Heads had come out of, and the students I was playing with were the next class after them. And so they already sort of had this idea of playing kind of music that was on the margins. And right. so my, my out of tune guitar sounded fine with them, <laughs> you know. And so we were doing different things, but the guitar was tuned in a traditional, in a standard tuning, um, E to E. And so that was fine. But I, I kind of had the sense that I wanted to sort of really explode that. Like I really wanted to expand it, but I, I couldn't really construct in my mind like what that would be. And, I sort of had a feeling the Velvet Underground had accomplished that with their guitar sound, but I wasn't quite sure what they did. Um, but it wasn't until I saw some musicians playing in New York at that time in the 70s who were using guitars, playing a very sort of amped up instrumental music that was really rock, but at the same time was not rock. And that was these two gentlemen, Reese Chatham and Glenn Bronca. And the first time I saw Glenn Bronca play, he had uh, six electric guitars and a drummer and a bass player and just playing this long instrumental music that was completely loud like super volume and that volume was like an element of the music it created overtones and everything and he was accomplishing something with with the chording and the sound that I had only thought of I could only sort of fantasize about and there it was and so I I realized I, I believe I asked him talked about it and he was tuning the the guitars to different tunings. And so he had one guitar tuned to all high E's 
and the other guitar on the far end, all low E's, and then there was an A guitar and a G guitar. So basically what he did with those six guitars, each one was a string, and so it was like this big, massive guitar making this kind of orchestral music. And I was like, oh, you can change the tuning. And that was really interesting to me. And I didn't really want to, and I didn't, I never really got into it any more academically than that, even though later on I would become very fascinated by different academic ideas with it. But at that time, I would just close my eyes and start tuning the pegs, open strumming, and seeing what would come up. And I can actually show that to you, because yeah, that's yeah, kind of what, that, that's yeah, kind well, of what well, goes on right yeah. now. And so this tuning that I'll play right now is a tuning that I basically, I haven't really changed the, um, the, the mode of how I do it. And so I'll start, it'll sort of be in a tuning that I, I've had before and I have sort of had my way with. And so I'll, 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 I'll want to sort of go somewhere else. And I'll just start tuning the pegs and just sort of open strumming like this. Okay. tuning is a very open tuning and it's, it's basically the low string it's a D sharp and the two low strings are unison D sharps and I'm, and I'm really interested I, I actually became more interested just by this kind of um, playing I really got interested in drone music and, and realizing that drone music was really a, uh, essential to so much music from different places around, the, indigenous cultures around the world that weren't um, e USA or UK. It was like music coming out of India. And, 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 and so that to me was really curious because I really, I was, kind of, I, I was really drawn towards raga music um, early on. And so I, to, to play it on an electric guitar as opposed to like a sitar or a traditional instrument from those cultures. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to sort of have this meeting in, in a way. And so, and um, not all the tunings that would, that uh, sort of transpired, particularly with the years with Sonic Youth, were sort of drone centric, but they might as well be. I mean, because we really sort of got into that where the three guitars between um, Lee, Kim, and myself <clears throat> would sort of um, interact quite a bit. We never really played the three of us in the same tuning. And it primarily would be myself bringing a tuning and then Lee reacting to it with another tuning. And, and, then, and then Kim Tertiary would re react to that as well. So, uh, uh, as well as playing bass guitar. So would you ever know when you were going into uh, a Sonic Youth rehearsal and someone's bringing something in, you would never know actually what the finished song would sound like? We, ne almost. we never knew what we were doing, <laughs> first of all. <laughs> I'm sorry. Got off, I'm off the mic. Hey, hey, hey. Could you hear me just then? I was, I was just talking out into the wind. Oh, um. <laughs> no, we, in Sonic Youth, it was, I mean, we started so young, you know, I was still yeah. in my early 20s when we started. I'm, you know, I'm turning 61 this year, so things have changed, yeah. you know, to say the least. But um, at that time, um, we, it wasn't really, we, it wasn't so, it wasn't so, th Thoughtful. I mean, it wasn't like you know we would discuss these things. They were. It was very reckless in a way. Yeah. And and which I liked because it was sort of like in tune with what we were liking about a lot of music that was coming out of uh, the punk rock scene anyway, which we felt very uh, much a, an affinity with. Yeah. Was just like this kind of behavior that was like you. It was. It was rather reckless, and you sort. Of, it was almost like the I Ching, where you just throw it on a table and then yeah. you sort of use. I those mean, it's almost to do anything else to be too regimented would have been the antithesis of punk, wouldn't it? If you didn't uh, possibly, so, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it, it was about it. sort of like taking matters into your own hands. Yeah. And it was, it, was, it was all about, 
It wasn't anti-rock and roll, no matter how, that get, how, that does get professed in punk rock, but it wasn't. It was actually a, it was very much a passionate love for rock mm. and roll, and it was a one. It was it was an idea of reclaiming uh, the the essence of what you you thought in rock and roll. Yeah. When you know when Patti Smith on that great live uh, version of the Who's My Generation, which came out in '76 on that record, you know, where they just destroy the stage you know, with her instruments and, you know, a la The Who, but, and, and she just grabs the mic and says, we created it, let's take it over. Those were really, imp <laughs> that yeah. was a really important dictum, you know, to hear, to hear you know, it's like, let's take it over, you know, because well, no, this is when, our music. It's the, pe they, it was always the idea of, the, of, of rock and roll being the music of the people as opposed to the music of the, of the corporations yeah. to sell to, back to the people. Yeah. So that was sort of the reclamation. When you, when you write, I mean, I, I mean, there's so many questions. One, how many guitars do you now have? I have a few. I was never really into... I have a few. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I have exactly a few. how many? I don't... Um, you know, in Sonic Youth, it was, it, we were a democracy and we shared our equipment. Uh -huh, so okay. that we never... It was never this thing of, like, that's my guitar, that's my guitar. Right. Even though we, we did sort of uh, use um, uh, specific guitars each other. But, uh, you know, when it com came down to it, they belonged to the group. And that's how we liked it. When we wrote songs... No matter who brought the song in, it was credited to the group. We never, ever, ever had a credit that was towards any one musician in the group. It was always all songs, all music, all lyrics, Sonic Youth. So, you know, if somebody in the group wrote 80% of the lyrics, and I'm not pointing fingers, um, they it got credit to the it got credit to the rest of the band because that yeah. band was the forum for those lyrics to exist in. So Steve Shelley's drum patterns, those are his lyrics, you know. So we yeah. all share this, yeah, okay. we all share yeah. this, 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 this work together. And that was really, that was a very important thing to the band, yeah. to never leave that. Because I noticed when bands did start that way and then leave that way and start parsing out the, the you know, the um, specific, specifics of what they were doing in the band, that's when the band would fracture and, and become less interesting. Well, as somebody who ran a record label for a little while in the, the 90s and certainly had one very successful band who, the, obviously the money was shared with, I wrote the song so I get X amount of money. Yeah. I won't say who it is. Elastical. Oh, just about, yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> But the, um, so you have a few guitars. Do you have different? Because um, I mean, you've probably got loads of, or loads of. You've played so many different jazz masters. What, what, what I'm getting at, I think, is: Do you have different guitars for different jobs? Do you write on a, a, a specific guitar? Is there something that you feel comfortable with? Which, in the creative process, you think, "Yeah, I love this guitar. This is the." This is the one I feel most comfortable with. Yeah, more or less. I mean, lots of, lots, of, lots of musicians do modify, particularly the jazz master. They yeah. they modify the guitar, don't they? Themselves? Well, I, I certainly modify this one. But you know, to tell you that the, the honest truth, I was never, uh, I never considered myself a guitar nerd or a guitar geek. Mm. And usually on tour, um, musicians that I tour with, be it in Sonic Youth or other uh, groups, whatever, the guitarists always want to go to the guitar stores. And I want to go to the record store or the bookstore <laughs> or the charity shop. <laughs> but I, you know, for me to go into a guitar store is like, well, I already have a guitar or two. I don't really need another one. And so there, I, I always saw them guitars more uh, primarily just as as really functional. Um, and they were like automobiles in a way because they were expensive. And I didn't really, I just like, I didn't really have the coin to start collecting guitars. You know, it was like collecting cars or something. But I understood it. And I, and I appreciate and love the beauty and value of different guitars. But we were always a, a Fender guitar band. And I think at first when we started, we just had all kinds of just like no-name jerry rig guitars because they were inexpensive. And we would buy them and they didn't really sound right um, in traditional tuning, as I was saying earlier. So we started modifying them then and we started sort of doing things such as putting different implements underneath like the 12th fret and then it's creating like a situation like this. Like, I'll show you. I don't have any tools on me, but anything will work. Like a pen, you're a writer, so I'll just. <laughs> right. <laughs> so with this situation, I can sort of play. And using the, using the guitar's own sort of uh, electronics, I can sort of 
create another element to it. that could become even more I think that's nice worth a round of applause. Yeah. <laughs> that's one thing you can do with a pen. And, uh, <laughs> so we sort of got into that because it, it made those junky guitars we had sound really cool. And yeah. so the, and it got away from just sort of like uh, the guitar playing of um, just kind of like the, the hoary old tradition classic guitar of like, you know, you have to be Mr. Clapton to do this. And it's like, well, no, you don't. You can, it's like, yeah. so we, we really, we're, the, we really had fun doing it. It was really fun. I mean, Lee would do things where he would get a, 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 a drill, like a power drill, and he would put it up against the pickups and just like create this amazing sound. So it was all about creating noises from the guitar. The guitar could just do so much. Lee actually knew how to play quite well uh, high technique guitar. He was studied some Garcia and all this kind of stuff before yeah. he joined the band. So he's sort of, he's a l couple of years old, <clears throat> older than I am. So he sort of had that much more time pre-punk to actually sort of <laughs> study the guitar. But I came of age really un like in punk. I mean, I was like, 20 in 1978 so it was just like it was like that was everything for me and getting rid of all those recordings that I had all the records of Led Zeppelin and whatever and putting them in mom's basement and so by in 1979 or 1980 you go visit mom and you go in the basement and there's this crate of records that predated 1976 and you forgot about them and they were just these kind of moldy dinosaurs that were just it was kind of scary and kind of yeah. frightening to me to see them. I was like, because I had completely erased them from my consciousness because so much amazing music had happened at that time. That it, and it, that music was all about identifying itself away from this previous culture. Yeah, I think it's strange as well, don't you find that? I mean, you know, people, when people ask me about, I don't know, what's your favorite Beatles record? I've got, I've probably got, two Beatles records, and one of them is the best of the Beatles. But, you know, I, when I first started listening to the John Peel program, which is around late 78, 79, I suppose, you never thought about going back. And anyway, you couldn't get those records if you didn't buy the record. Nine yeah. months later, it was, unless you, there was a second-hand shop, you wouldn't get those records. There was too much. We were always going forward. You yeah. never looked back. We just never had time to look back because there's always something else. Which, I mean, is, I mean, it is also a sort of description, really, of what Sonic Youth were as well, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, you, I mean, never, I you never looked, you've never looked back. Well, really. I figured, I, I mean, think. I think we as a group, we felt like most people did it in that time that you, you kind of had decoded everything that had happened up to that point to 76. So you didn't want to keep repeating it. You wanted to sort of do something that was completely new. That's why they called it New Wave. I mean, it, was, it really was like a new time. And it, um, in a way, it was interesting how it, it, it just it progressed through um, into the 80s, into the 90s, into now. It's just like, there's just, it, it was such a, uh, a liberating situation. It was a liberating time. It was almost necessary that it had happened because um, it just sort of did do a rebuild. But, you know, I, I, it, it wasn't um, about losing a sense of um, respect towards the history of, of music, be it rock and roll or whatever. Because I think by the late 70s into the 80s, it, you, you, there was a reappraisal of what was great about music that predated punk. That certainly, hap that certainly happened big time. Um, 
And you know, we went so far as to call one of our records at that time Bad Moon Rising, that was sort of in reference to um, Credence Clearwater Revival, who were this band that were stylists of kind of old timey music, and but in a rock and roll context. Yeah. You know. How much? Um, how many days? You don't pick up a guitar every day, do you? Just do you? I, or do I, you? I, no? <laughs> I <clears throat> I go through periods. Right. I'm not like you know. It's not like this idea of daily practice. I don't feel. I don't. I don't practice. Let's put it that way. No. I, I I pick it up to 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 um, write music. Yeah. I really like writing music. And so if okay. Uh, so set the day out for us. So you sit down. Where do you start? You pick up your guitar. Uh, you sit down. And then what's what do you do? Have you got the idea in your head already, or do you just do no. you do almost as if what you've been doing? You no, know, it it, it's, it's completely through, it's through, uh, it's just complete audio creativity. Right. Um, the ideas are always sort of germinating uh, through all kinds of stimuli that you, you go through in your life, be it through literature, be it through film, be it through um, just visual art, be it through um, just situations that are sort of emotional, uh, personal. And so all this sort of, I find all this, all of these things in your life that are sort of part of your own sort of creative uh, consciousness come into play when you actually sit down and take your instrument in hand. But it must so be I that, trust that. But know? it must be days. You must have to, I mean, don't you just, some days you're mining for a sound or looking for a sound and the sound never comes? Or do you always find um, If I find myself really sort of struggling and frustrated by trying to do something, I'll put it down and walk away. Knowing that uh, it's like, that that leads into a piece of music that that will always have that kind of vibe of frustration, and so I kind of walk away. I've learned to walk away from it in a way. And you know, there's so many recordings on Sonic Youth records that I don't really listen to our records so much. But sometimes you have to because we there's this kind of remastering stuff that goes on or whatever. So you have to sort of listen to. And there's a and I I find that personally there's a, there's so much. There's so many tunes that have compromise in them because of you're struggling to sort of get it quote unquote right, you know. So you have four people and more people when you have an engineer and everything trying to get this thing correct and right. And sometimes I find that there's there's a bit of a compromise that goes on of, of settling on a certain something or other, and it does and it loses a sense of its initial freedom. Um, it's a little hard to explain, no, I but I, I, I think that. that's you know that that's something that I've always worked on trying to overcome yeah. um, that situation. So I kind of walk away, I walk away, and I, I figure that you know um, time is elastic. We have all the time in the world. It's like you know we don't need to sort of accomplish all these things in the world. This is like you're basically making music as a exercise and sharing sort of hopefully joy. You know, I mean, unless you're kind of a, like a nefarious black metal band from Siberia or something. <laughs> but some of yeah, my, my favorite bands. Some are. of my favorite bands. Yeah. Yeah. But like I this bet. guitar, like this this tuning. Like when I I came up with the tuning, I was like, okay, well, I want to write something on it, and I had it in my mind to write something that was in reference to a lot of the guitar music that I really actually was inspired by in the late 70s in New York City, right. such as the music I was hearing uh, playing with gentlemen like Reese Chatham and Glenn Branca. And just the whole no wave scene around New York, around uh, bands like The Contortions and Teenage Jesus and The Jerks. And so I, I, uh, I just started doing a simple exercise on the guitar. Um, Glenn Bronco had a really great tune where he just used these two notes that kept sort of building up. And these two notes were something, uh, something like this. It was like... Was a piece of music that he wrote. Uh, it's a it's a bit of a 15, 20 minute long instrumental piece, and it became ferocious. And but it, that was the motif, and it just kept building up into these different um, structures on the on the on the guitar neck. And so I wanted to do something that was in reference to that. Glenn lived uh, in a in a in a small flat with his girlfriend at the time in the 70s, on 8 Spring Street. And so I called this piece 8 Spring Street. I've been playing it, but I'll play a little bit of it. But I wanted to sort of, I noticed that his line was sort of going up to down, up to down. 
And I decided I would do something that would go down to up, and that would sort of turn it around. And Glenn was a bit of a dark character. He sort of he would go towards he would go towards negative sounds to create like this idea of uplift uplifting. I just sort of wanted to do something that was initially positive that would go uplifting. So I just started doing a piece of music that was going like this. So I'm like. That's a piece of music. Again, a little bit of applause, I think. Oh, thank you. But that's just a very, 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 very top of a of yeah. of, of, of almost a, an hour-long piece of, of guitar music. It's an instrumental guitar piece that I've been playing live. I, I did a, a show um, in London at these at this venue called Under the Bridge, in uh, in um, where is it? In South London. It's under the it's under the Chelsea Pitch. Uh -huh. Does that does that rub you the wrong way, the Chelsea pitch? <laughs> He's like, yeah. And I, yeah. Um, no, because the 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 woman who plays uh, bass guitar with me is Deb Googe from My Bloody Valentine, yeah. Yeah. and she is um, she's a, a a Man United like freak. Like she loves loves Man United. She grew up next to her father watching Man United games. So to play underneath the Chelsea pitch was really difficult. Right. <laughs> 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 you should do a whole tour around football grounds, see how Richie Oh, yeah, well, you're fine yeah. with me. Yeah. I mean, one of, the, one of the interesting things about something like that is, and I think comes back to things which you've managed to achieve, which is making a deceptively sort of bigger sound, making things sound like there's a lot going on just through yeah. the strings on a guitar. Do you know what I mean? It's almost like you're trying to harness almost an orchestra, but with just six strings. I like to sort of approach the guitar as something that I like to investigate. When I do a tuning, I like to really investigate that tuning. And so I like to create first compositions that just sort of like are all about that investigation of like what that tuning can do. So they will, they will typically sort of um, be like single string moves that kind of will, will develop into like full six string. Uh, guitar moves. Is there a smoke machine on? Is this like, this, yeah, man. Well, so we have to talk like, yeah, how y'all doing out there? We have to like. It's either that or we're on fire. <laughs> You're on fire. Yeah. <laughs> How's everybody feeling tonight? <laughs> well, no, well, but how, how much, I mean, um, as, uh, as someone who's played guitars for all these years, do you, do you develop some sort of bond with the guitar? I know that sounds a little bit ridiculous, but as a non-guitarist, I mean, I just noticed this guitar has been with you for some time, I, I imagine. But do you, do you get sentimental about guitar? Do you, do you ever think, I need a new guitar? Or is it mm. this are now so much a part of you? No, yeah, I get very sentimental. Like, do this you? is... I, 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 I really keep an eye on this guitar. I've had, I've had at least two or three guitars that were really close to me, like soulfully and through my heart and just like playing for years, that got ripped off, that got stolen. Really? And that's happened for the last 20, 30 years, if not longer. I, I mean, I, I've, been, I've had guitars stolen. You know, it started out with that guitar that my brother gave to me. That was like heartbreaking because that was a Fender Stratocaster. And, and that, after that Fender Stratocaster got ripped off, I spent years just sort of playing like just whacked out junky guitars because like we didn't have any money. So the band would, 
just play those guitars. One of the first times that we started playing together, me, Lee, Kim, and whoever the drummer was at that time, it, it, it was before Bob Burt, and it was just kind of the three of us trying to figure out what we were gonna do, and I had the name. And so I was like, well, we have the name and we have this thing and we're like, you know, um, you know, Lee was a great guitarist and I was just kind of this like super freaked out experimental guitarist. And, uh, and Kim was coming at it through being a visual artist and looking at the guitars, like, you know, this, this painting that she would play. And so that was like, that was the dynamic of that group. Um, and then bringing in different drummers until we uh, really sort of got Steve Shelley in the band who was a really high technique drummer and then things really kind of took off. Um, I've, I always loved the guitars we had, but they, I knew that they were expendable. And the only reason we started buying Fender Jazzmaster is because in the mid 80s, we, when we actually sort of got a, a, a little bit of money to buy some new guitars or a guitar, we went to some secondhand guitar stores. And the Fender Jazzmaster at that time wasn't really being played uh, with any value in the rock and roll scene. It was kind of a country and western guitar, or like it was a jazz player's guitar, um, like Mundell Lowe or somebody was, you know, and so it wasn't really seen as like um, the rock and roll guitar. You know, Hendrix still had the Stratocaster thing, and Telecasters were hip, and then Gibsons were hip with all the New York Dolls set and the Steve Jones Sex Pistols and all this kind of stuff. So the Fender was kind of like, um, for us was like, we liked the Fender because, um, you know, Patti Smith played like, she played like a Fender Duo Sonic and she was coming out of her love for Fender guitars, loving Hendrix and loving the MC5. And so like her, her husband that she married, uh, Fred Sonic Smith, which is where the Sonic from Sonic Youth comes from, was a great Fender guitar player. And though all these things were signifiers for us. And so when we saw jazz masters that were, they were kind of affordable. They were cheaper than Telecasters and Stratocasters at this time. And the only person we knew who actually played a, a jazz master on stage was Tom Verlaine of television. And so that's, I remember being with Lee and going into the secondhand guitar store and there was a some couple of jazz masters and we we're just looking around for anything. And he said, oh, that's the guitar, that's the guitar Verlaine uses. Let, let's just get those. And that was, that was the selling point that Tom Verlaine from television played those guitars, and I was like, that, sure, why not? And then we realized when we got them that they had this. They had this bridge that was so, that was deep into the body, and that allowed us to sort of have this kind of, this chime that hardly any other guitar had. And we really loved that. And we use that a lot in Sonic Youth's music. You know, that, it, that to us was like, it was already, the guitar was already made for experimental guitar players. Yeah, yeah. You know? Because, you know, I mean, Tom Verlaine wasn't like ripping on the, on the, behind the bridge, but we, we did. And yeah. so we made that kind of our sound. And so and you've stuck with them ever since, the similar sort of guitar. You get used to a, a guitar and what it can do. Yeah. And it gives you the, it gives you what you need to be able to experiment. Because I sometimes think, you know, what, why, why torture a guitar? So why, what, what, <laughs> what, well, what drives you? Is it, is it experimentation? Is it frustration? Is it just curiosity? I suppose it, yeah. maybe it's a mixture of all those things. Well, I think through the do. years we found the limitations of, of, of the guitars, especially the jazz master. We would also get Jaguars or, or Jaguars. And, but I realized that the Jaguar's neck wasn't quite as long as a jazz master. And being as, as tall and lanky as I am, that really made sense to me to have that extra little thing there. And then it also allowed the neck to sort of have a bit more of a bend, um, which I really appreciated when we got more into sort of doing like this kind of thing. Let me show you, like, when we're, if we're doing sort of like...
Thank you. Thank you. This, um, but there's so much, I mean, I mean that, you know, that's just very, you know, um, just, but the, there's, there's a, we, we, through the years, we just sort of really would, especially playing live all the time, because we, we wanted to play live all the time. So we booked gigs everywhere and anywhere we could, every basement, every donut shop that we could play at. And we would really, um, the songs that we were writing, we, we would allow them to sort of have these places where we could stretch out and do that and really sort of listen to each other. And we really sort of got into this sense of improvisation with feedback um, without it just being kind of a blowout, which is fun too. I mean, just like, wow. But we, did, we, we, were, no, we were never really into just sort of freaking out and making a bunch of noise for the sake of it, even though that's always a blast. Yeah. We were really into sort of um, finding out what the properties of the guitar can do and how they work together and, and, and how to make it musical in a very noise slash feedback way, like how to make music from that. And that's, we got, I think by the time we got to the third album, we were really in that head. Yeah. So. Yeah. I think Evo was a, was a, was a real key moment along with various other key moments. I've just looked at the time and we are, officially we're out of time, but I've got- Time is a concept that is a human concept <laughs> that we created to constrict okay. each other. I, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that led it. Um, uh, got, got a couple of uh, other questions though. If, if it's all right, if we carry on for another five or 10 minutes, if that's all right, well, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. You're, you're, de you're definitely an official from the venue, are you? <laughs> okay. Um, given where we've, uh, given all the records you've made and the sounds you've discovered and the things that uh, you've created in terms of atmospheres and melodies, all the things you've done, where do you sometimes, how, do you have to set yourself a new challenge before you can find something new these days? Because you can't find things just by accident anymore, I wouldn't, I wouldn't imagine. Um, so do you, to just, because it also you don't want to repeat yourself, what do you do to keep moving forward and how do you continue to challenge the guitar and the guitar challenges you? Well, to tell you the truth, I never really think of it as um, a challenge. I, I, I think of it as wanting to really continue to explore songwriting. Right. Like for me, songwriting is like where the true experimentation comes in. And that was even true in, in, in Sonic Youth. It was like a, a lot of the times the story was about like how the band detunes and retunes the guitar, uses different string gauges, remodifies the guitar like the, the jazz masters we would take out all of these top electronics because they were in the way all we needed was a volume pot and the and the and the, and the uh, pickup switch that's all we needed so we would constantly do that thereby devaluing the traditional uh, fender guitar so when people steal our guitars they can't sell them because they're just like well these they're fucked up you know there's like <laughs> you can't play these things and so there's a certain beauty in that but they are "Quote unquote yeah. Sonic Youth guitars, so they have their own value. And uh, does, does, since Sonic Youth, do you write in a different way because you're writing for yourself? You're not. Are you less conscious of a band, or is, do oh, you write completely like, different? Yeah. No, Sonic Youth was a thing unto its own. It was. It was. It was a. Um, it was a. It was made up of. It, that was a sum of its parts. You know, there was no. Um, even though. Uh, I might have been sort of the Leo instigator uh, amongst, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. It was, the, no, the band was complete, we grew up together. And so it was like, there was, there was, there was no hierarchy in the band as, as, that's con as, as far as that's concerned. Um, so that is something that I don't think can be repeated. Um, and I'm not really willing to repeat that. I don't really want to like start a band again and have that kind of like, uh, that, that kind of relationship. Mm. I, 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 I've, I've done it for over but 30 years. So at this point in my time, I just like, I want to be, I want to be the leader. I want to call the shots. I want to tell everybody what to do. And so <laughs> I, I'm not looking for a band that sort of yeah. has, I have no interest in replicating it. Yeah. I don't think that's, so I don't play like Sonic Youth material ever live unless it's sort of a special occasion or something yeah. sometimes, you know, but, uh, um, 
I'm not interested in it. I hardly ever play songs I wrote five years ago by myself live because I, I don't really, I don't really like having to having to do that, you know. But if there's some kind of like, oh, can you play that album again in full for this event? It's a little corny, but I'll do it because it is kind of fun, you know. Yeah. I, you know, if when you go see Patti Smith do horses, it's great, yeah. you know. So it's like I, I, I understand that. I, I appreciate that kind of catalog thing, yeah. but. Um, um. Yeah. As we're over time, uh, this is purely uh, uh, f for my own clear pleasure. Um, of all the guitar riffs written by other people, what's the one? Have you ever felt jealous, slightly envious, and oh. thought, I really wish I, that should have been me. I wish I'd have written that. I used to have a dream when I was a, not a dream, but I used to have this fantasy when I was a little kid that I would uh, rocket ship to another planet, and they had never heard Jumpin' Jack Flash, uh, or or Black Dog, or, you know, or all the, and all these or Satisfaction or whatever, um, uh, ever. And then you know, Instant Karma or something. And I was like, yeah. oh, I got these great songs. I want to sort of, you know, I would turn on the entire planet to these songs. But then I realized, like, well, that's kind of uh, disingenuous because they're really not your songs. They come from these 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 visionaries who wrote these songs. So I kind of lost that fantasy as I got older. But is there some you know, I was really, at the time, um, uh, I remember when uh, Dinosaur Jr. F put out like maybe their second or third album, and we were very close to them, and we kind of, we kind of mentored them as they were starting and coming up, and, and we recognized that they were kind of amazing, especially through what was Jay was doing with guitar, because Jay Maskus was a, a drummer in a hardcore band that moved to guitar, and then all of a sudden he was just like, like, it was like there's something going on there. Like he really knows how to play the guitar. Like it's, it's like this like second nature thing. And they did this record, "You're Living All Over Me," which Lee actually sings on the first song, uh, "Little Fury Things." And I remember hearing that that record and hearing Jay actually just do this f completely fantastic lead guitar work on it. And it was coming out of this sort of punk hardcore kind of noise rock art rock world. And then all of a sudden there was like this really sort of very sophisticated guitar work going on this record that, that owed a lot to Jimmy Page, that owed a lot to, you know, these kind of players, like, yeah. you know, uh, Deep Purple or something. Yeah. And I was just like, oh, that's really cool. Like, I really, I was really envious of that, like that he actually could do that. And that, so I would say that, okay. you know, in, in a way would, would, would be an answer. <laughs> and he's actually, he just played here in Brighton the other night, I think. Did he tell you? Oh, I didn't know that. Right. He was playing in London last night. Right. So he's on a little bit of a tour. Okay, we're done for time. Who wants one minute of guitar? Can, we, can you do us one more? We'll give one last burst of, uh, of something, anything you'd like to magic up for us.
Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very, very much for coming along to see us here at uh, Fender. I've been Steve Mac. A huge round of applause for our hero, Thurston Moore. <laughs>